Hello and welcome to the Icario podcast, episode 39. In this conversation, Dean and Shane talk about mental and emotional resilience. In this conversation, they also talk about the importance of building self-awareness and how this can transform your relationship to your life and equip you and empower you to do different things with it. When it comes to strengthening the muscle of self-observation, over the past year, on the Acario team, Dean has arguably done more work in this area than any of us. And in this conversation, he talks about his experiences with self-awareness, with growing the powers of self-observation and how this transformed his life in a positive way. And as always, we love to keep things practical. So in this episode, expect lots of actionable tips and takeaways. The show notes for this episode are at ikario.com forward slash 039. And as always, we love hearing your voice messages. So if you want to leave us one of those, go to anchor.fm forward slash Icario. So with all of the housekeeping out of the way, I hope you enjoy the episode as much as I did. Welcome to the Icario podcast. Today, I'm talking with Dean again. He is, he's been on the podcast before, is one of the Icario team members. And today we'll be talking about the topic of developing like mental and emotional fortitude, which is something we've touched on before. Like the last time I think we really dedicated an episode to this would have been actually like episodes three and four, very early on in our wow, how back. to get yeah, in our how to get your shit together series. We talked about this kind of topic and how well one of the things is in developing your mind in various ways, which can be through things like, you know, reading and learning and learning to use mental models and strategic thinking and things like that, but also developing your mind in the sense of like gaining self-awareness and mindfulness, so maybe through meditation and things like that, is it's one of those things that is, in a way, it's a bit unexciting. Mm -hmm. You say, hey, you know, you gain more self-awareness. Like, <laughs> I don't know. It's not going to be a long queue out the door for, yeah. for gain self-awareness. Little here. do you know, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It can be exciting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's... And, and well, the thing I think is it's like it's easy to underestimate or it's easy to underrate because ultimately this kind of stuff really determines so much of how you view the world and how you experience the world is actually determined by things like, um, yeah, it's basically determined by how do you interpret the world and what's, go what's going on inside your head. Um, this kind of, it could be such a huge difference to be in the exact same situation with the same thing happening to you. But in one case, there's all this mental chatter, there's all this neurotic thought that's causing loads of suffering, mm. that's taking you out of the moment, and that's essentially crippling you. It's crippling your ability to, uh, you know, to make good decisions or, or even just to, you know, to enjoy yourself in a situation or whatever it is. Yeah. It's crippling that ability from the outside, it might not be obvious, but it, it, you could be in that exact same situation. And simply because of the way your mind works, because of how that inner world looks like, your experience of the same situation is totally different. And your capability, your ability to be in the moment, to make good decisions, to, to do whatever you want to do in the moment is so deeply affected by this factor. Yeah. And so today, yeah, we want to revisit this, um, go into this again and talk a bit about, uh, yeah, a few more tools and practical examples of... of exactly. And, and specifically, I'd like to focus a lot on self-awareness or watching one's own emotions and the subsequent behavior, sort of becoming an observer of your own behavior, because I feel that over the course of the last year, I've seen major progress in four areas of my life, that is holding new habits, good habits, breaking old bad habits, letting go of the neurosis like you just described. And then the other one is uh, early warning signs of how you can um, fix this and something that I've picked up on recently. So those are kind of the four things that I want to do, but they're all around the idea of observing yourself. All right. So yeah, tell me more about how did this come up? Like you've clearly been doing a lot of work in this, in this area of your life and seeing results, like what triggered that or what happened? It was a series of different things that were conversations on the team, exercises that we did. And over 
this period of time, I've noticed that it was a pattern. <laughs> and the same kind of teaching came up, even though the words and the ideologies behind it maybe sounded different. So for example, uh, we have the, you introduced me to Wait But Why, mm -hmm. almost over a year ago. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, waitbutwhy.com. Exactly. Uh, the world's greatest blog. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, which uh, I definitely also recommend if you want to learn more about sort of where we come from, that series in particular. Mm -hmm. And right away in the first in the first blog article, he talks about this idea of the battle between fire and light, which is basically the 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 fire is the caveman in you, and then the light is this enlightened angelic spirit in your head. And there's mm -hmm. these two versions of yourself. Mm. And he made the picture very clear that you could identify with the, yeah, the caveman and the enlightened one. But we also know this concept from like the monkey brain versus the lizard brain. So that was the first time that I'd kind of thought of it in a different way. Mm -hmm. And then later on, I had a conversation with Ollie and we were just we were chatting about like Freud's view of this, which is the the id versus the ego. Mm -hmm. like ah, that's like those other two things. And uh, yeah, so it, it kept repeating on itself. And uh, oh yeah, then Stoic philosophy, and that was the one, <laughs> how could I yeah. forget? <laughs> that was something that I wasn't very familiar with before. And it's been something we talk about on the team. And the more I dug into it, that I got this awareness that it's not about getting rid of your emotions, which is something that I'd been doing for a long, long time, but just sitting with them. Mm -hmm. And that was like the fourth time the same ideology came by that you, you just sit with it and you view the two different versions of yourself and how they react. Yeah, this is also, um, we've also talked about like developing self-acceptance and self-love before, mm. right? And, and it's true. It's like, it's almost like there's so many philosophies and so many stories that essentially end up in the same place. Yeah. Because, yeah, like you were saying, okay, stoicism is about you, you accept the things you can control. Freud and and that kind of branch of psychology is all about you know like the stuff you repress uh, then surfaces in some other way so it's like trying to repress things trying to push things away is kind of pointless uh, you have uh, you have a buddhist idea of also like just acceptance and just being like look your thoughts and feelings and so on they just arise and you, you try to fight them it's futile it just <laughs> yeah. causes suffering and so on and so forth right it's it's, it's almost like again and again humanity comes to this conclusion exactly and someone's like hey listen listen this is important yeah. and then it develops like a new branch of philosophy and that's what i reached was that like within my own lifetime now i've like ah i've reached it i have yeah. now my own version of this which is all of those combined and the takeaway was very simple you observe and then react that's mm. what I'm practicing now, because in the past it was always react and then observe, mm. meaning you're in a bad situation, something bad happens to you and you react, you react with some outburst sort of ah, straight away. Mm -hmm. And then afterwards you find yourself observing yourself going, oh, why did I do that? And I regret this. And so it's react, observe. Mm -hmm. If you can flip those around, it changes everything. So something bad happens to you and you're just like, I'm angry, I observe that I'm angry, okay, now I'm gonna react. And mm -hmm. the reaction is, I'm angry. Mm -hmm. And when you start with that foot, you're still angry, but you can resolve it with that person straight away. Like, yeah, listen, no. listen, I'm angry. Can, can we like resolve this? Can we talk about it? The moment you go, ah, it's over, mm -hmm. it's done. You, you, no resolution. So this is one example of how flipping yeah. them. Yeah, yeah, it, it's, this, is, this is funny, like I have, um, and this will this will come up in in the near future as well. But I have this idea that I I, I realize at some point. You know how sometimes you, you're having a discussion and you get defensive, right? Someone says something that you you see as maybe um, an insult or an attack or, or even just a jab, right? Even mm -hmm. just a slight jab, and you immediately start to defend your position. And at some point, I realized, like, you know what? I think that's never useful. I think it's never, never. the right way. To communicate is to be on the defensive like yeah. that. And so I started paying attention to that and, and trying to, it's basically one of the things I try to never be defensive, right? And and it's it's a similar thing, right? Where if you allow that to happen, if you you interpret something as, oh, this is 
you take it personally in some way, right? Some way. You take it personally in some way. You rush to the defense, and it basically never works. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's usually then you're defensive, the other person gets defensive, and then it usually escalates from there. Mm -hmm. And if you if you can just observe, like I say, if you first observe, like, oh, that hurts, and then hold on, why is that? And then because if you think about it, there's always a better way to respond. It, like you said, in retrospect, if you look back at that conversation, you can see that mm. your defensiveness didn't actually serve whatever exactly. your goal was. Like you, you didn't convince anyone yeah. with your defensiveness. Exactly. Right? <laughs> you didn't win the argument. <laughs> and so there's, there's always a better way to respond. Yeah. And sometimes it is exactly like you said, if you can just call out what happened, if you just like, listen, the thing you just said is like hurtful to me, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, even you, if you, you just can start engage there. from that point. Yeah, yeah. So instead of post observe, pre observe, mm. you know that's the thing. So how do you actually? Can you? Is there yeah. an example? Is there like a, a specific example where you've applied this? And can you tell us more about well how to I've, do that? I've got one that happened like very recently, like okay. yesterday morning. Okay. And this is just a sign that it doesn't always work out, but it's still working in my favor and improving my life. And it was very simple. Ryan and I were having a conversation, and he said something that I didn't like, kind of sit well with me and I went into straight into defensive mode mm -hmm. and I said yeah yeah but I can't I can't I can't some kind of explanation about that and he like we weren't angry at each other but we didn't get anywhere in the conversation so we just like yeah yeah cool okay and we walked away sat down at the computer and I'm like ah oh, I just did it again mm -hmm. went into defensive mode and I thought about it and I'm like I actually want to know what Ryan said, had to say because I blocked him. I didn't right. give him an opportunity to, to express himself mm. because of some kind of internal conflict with myself. So I walked back to him and I said, Ryan, I got defensive there before we even got going. I actually do want to hear what you had to say. And then he told me and we had this like great conversation. Mm. So that was me uh, kind of doing it post actively. I didn't, didn't catch it early enough. But by doing that repeatedly, like where you go back to the conversation and say, listen, I realize that I actually do want to engage with this. I, I sh should have said this earlier, but I'm, I'm saying it now. Yeah, I think, that's, I think that's really important because if you try to tell yourself, okay, I'm going to be like, now I'm going to have this Zen master attitude from <laughs> now on, you know, it's probably not going to work out. No. Right? <laughs> because you have to practice this kind of thing. Yeah. It's like everything is a is a habit. Everything is a skill as well. So being able to observe what's happening and then react, it is a skill. You have to, mm -hmm. you know, if, if you've just had this idea now, or this is the first time you've heard of it, it's like, well, you have zero practice in doing this right now. Yeah. And so in the beginning, you'll, you won't be good at it. And you have to give yourself the opportunity to practice. And I think simply realizing that you can go back essentially. So mm. even if you realize, oh, I, I I failed at doing it just now, that doesn't mean like, oh, too bad, game over. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you exactly. can actually go back. And the more you do that, the more you'll be able to catch it earlier on. Right? Yeah. It's like you're building that habit. In the beginning, there's a lag time and you, you're you're closing that gap from, from when something triggers you or when something comes up. And the, the gap between that and your ability to catch it and be like, okay, I'm going to observe this first. Exactly. You're like closing that gap with practice. And there was something in the book, No More Mr. Nice Guy from Dr. Robert Glover that is very useful. He calls it the, the deer approach, D-E-E-R. Mm -hmm. And basically D for defensive, E for explain, E for evade, and uh, um, R for rationalize. Mm -hmm. So if you find yourself doing any of those in a conversation, you're probably engaging in, in some kind of behavior that you could do differently. Mm. So yeah, th those in that moment with Ryan, I had like a mix of all of those four things, especially the rationalizing and explaining part, because that is the way I defend. Yeah, yeah, totally. It, it also reminds me of like the, almost like the Socratic approach, you know, where you just, you ask questions. Mm. I think that's often really, really powerful because you, again, this, it's one of those things that is like easier, much easier said than done is seek to understand before seeking to be understood. Mm. Um, and yeah, I think that's often a really useful way to communicate is just keep asking questions until you're sure that, that you understand and that they understand that you understand. Mm -hmm. um, but this is the exact same thing, right? It's like, 
that's something you have to practice. It's often very difficult to do that in the moment. Mm -hmm. um, but it is, in a way, the opposite of all of those things. It's the opposite of rationalizing and defending and so on. Mm -hmm. It's just being like, okay, I'm, I'm going to wait with, with my point, essentially, mm -hmm. and I'm going to wait until I actually gain some understanding. An interesting thing about this is also, like, this works, but only in, in like, a good faith setting. Right, so if yeah. you're having a debate or something with someone who just wants to win, mm. then then this won't work because they'll just it's exploit true. this, right? They'll just the fact that you're that you're giving them space and time to express themselves, they'll just exploit this to continuously, um, yeah, do whatever. And that's I feel like that's you know the nature of like internet debate has become that exactly where it's just like oh any any if you give me more time. If you ask me a question, I'm just going to use that to ridicule you and, mm -hmm. and and all this kind of stuff, right? Where because it's only about scoring points. Like who cares about exactly. whether it's right or wrong? Yeah, it, it's interesting because we often try to fix things when they're most broken, but these things come up every day, and that's what's changing in my life by having seen it so repeatedly mm. and starting to understand it for myself. It's like as soon as you feel that slight discomfort, if you can just become aware of it. That's all it takes. Just like, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> just you don't even have to fix it every time. Just become aware of it first. That's step number one. And and everything we're talking about now is conversations. Yeah. So that's a good starting point. Like whenever you're communicating with somebody, and like you said, don't let it be in a fight with somebody. Let it be in daily conversations with colleagues, with friends. Like really everyday stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's also about observing the small, mm -hmm. the small instances of this instead of only thinking about the big, exactly <laughs> the big fight you had yeah. and, and yeah. trying to deconstruct that. Like like that example with Ryan, it was an insignificant conversation. Mm -hmm. Completely, we wouldn't even have thought twice about it. But because I've been so aware of this, mm -hmm. um, it's like ah, there it is, there it is, and it's it's no effort on my part either. But let, let's move on to a different topic. So not yeah, just yeah. about conversations, but how good habits, how do you use this to like sort of keep good habits? Mm -hmm. And I've noticed that with myself, I, it's the stopping and starting of something that's good for you. That is kind of the thing that people struggle with the most. Yeah. And if, again, you can start to become just aware of how you treat yourself in those moments, both on the stop and on the restart. And I find that most people will obviously be very hard on themselves, like, oh, I stopped that again. I, I hate myself. Mm. But it can be even worse when they start again. I've, I've seen people, and I've been guilty of this, like, oh, I'm starting again. Like, I'll never get this right. I mean, that's just a really bad place to start in a good habit. Yeah, It's like, oh, this is like the 10th time I'm starting this, this diet or the 10th time I'm yeah. starting to exercise. So if you can catch yourself saying things like that to yourself, if like, ah, I'm being so hard on myself again, that's the opportunity to start just changing something around. Because mm. what I realized is every time I'm starting again, I'm actually just doing it again. Let it go and just give yourself that little moment of gratitude, that little, mm. I'm doing it again, I'm doing it again. And over the course of say two years with my diet now, I've, I've been really becoming better and better and better at that, that you start noticing the gap between fall off and, and start is like, it shrinks mm -hmm. and it shrinks mm -hmm. and it shrinks. And what used to take me two months to get back on is like two weeks. And eventually where I'm now, it's like, it's two days. And the great thing is you realize that when you've done this long enough, the fall off, it, you almost need it. It's called taking a break. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I realized like with exercise, you have to take a break. Otherwise, you just, you're going to hurt yourself. Mm -hmm. And I'm really happy that if just by becoming aware of it, I'm like, wait a minute, I'm not falling off. This is just a normal, healthy cycle. Mm -hmm. So super important. Yeah, this is also something that, this is a mistake I made for a really long time uh, when it comes to exercise, where I was, you know, I'll give an oversimplified example, but you have some kind of an exercise plan that said, let's say it says you you train your, I don't know, um, you know, you train upper body and then you you have one day rest and then you train again or something like that, right? So we have like this interval. 
And this idea of, okay, this is the optimal thing is I do this really intense training session, then I have a rest day and then I do it again. And that would, I would constantly let that get in the way because I'm like, okay, oh, I haven't exercised yet today, but I don't have enough time. And so I'm not going to exercise today because if I exercise today, then I'll have to rest tomorrow. So I'll ra I'd rather do an exercise session tomorrow, but then tomorrow something else gets in the way, right? And it's just like, I'm constantly not exercising mm -hmm. because I want to exercise in the ideal way. Mm -hmm. It's just like, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. The reality is any exercise is better than none. Okay. Yeah. And it's, <laughs> it's perfectly fine. And for me, that, that was a huge difference when I basically got to the point where I was, look, I can allow myself to just, if I, if I want to just go do one set of pull-ups and that's it, that's fine. I don't have to be like, oh, how does this fit into a training plan? Is that part yeah. of my micro cycle? Blah, blah, blah. No, it doesn't fucking matter. Just if you want to do some pull-ups, do some pull-ups. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Because any exercise is better than no exercise. And it's the same for, for other things like, you know, green smoothies, for example. I used to have a green smoothie every day for quite a long time. And I don't do that anymore. But it's also, I don't tell myself I either have a green smoothie every day or not at all. It's just any any time I have a green smoothie, that is a super healthy thing to do. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if I have one a week, that's better than zero a week. If yeah. I have two a week, that's better than one a week. It's just yeah. like any amount of this is better than none. Yeah. And this is where the sort of daily gratitude exercises really, really help. And it's not something I did before, but since I've been on this team, it's something mm. it's like I've been relentlessly writing every even if it's just a single line mm -hmm. and it's just a reminder of like i'm grateful for the fact that i started again i'm grateful for the fact that i started again mm -hmm. <laughs> or didn't stop that didn't stop that it's mm -hmm. that, that's all it takes and i think one must also like a, a point here is don't be afraid to be grateful for the same thing over and over again because mm. we've had that in the feed that we have in the in the community feed where you kind of sit there and you're like ah oh, i need to find something new to be grateful for screw it. <laughs> I'm grateful for the same thing I was grateful for yesterday. It's fine. And and you know what? I haven't done that enough. And I'm actually going to, I'm going to do that more often. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, that's, that's a good point. And it's, it's also like, you know, this just reminds me of something in Atomic Habits by James Clear. And from, from all indications, from what I can tell, James Clear is someone who has, is very consistent. It's a very consistent person, which is something most of us struggle with, right? But even he says, like, it's interesting that one of his rules, I think, is like basically don't put up two zeros in a row. Mm. So it's like, okay, you you have your training plan or your habit, whatever the habit is, and and you miss a day, like make it a priority to not miss another day. Because when you miss two days in a row, you're starting to build the habit of not doing the thing. But it's interesting to see that um, because clearly if he was perfectly consistent, he wouldn't need that rule. Mm -hmm. And I think that's also like, there's this ideal of consistency, which is, it makes sense, right? A lot of things, you know, if you, it's true that consistency, that there's there's huge value in consistency, right? If you, if you train every single day for a year versus you train every once in a while for a year, there's a big difference, right? You meditate every day or you meditate like one or twice, once or twice a week for a long time, it makes a big difference. So it's true that there's great value in consistency, but I think, like you said, the reality of consistency for most people and most habits is not that you do this 100% of the time, no single exception. The reality yeah. is like, you know, even if it's, even if you're highly consistent, maybe you do it 100 days in a row and then you miss one or two days and then you do it 100 days in a row. But it's not perfect consistency mm. because that's generally just not how the world works. Mm. And it's just not how human beings work, right? It's normal for things to get derailed in some form or another. And it's really important that you're not overly attached to, um, or yeah, if, you, if you're if you overly judgmental and, and punishing yourself and so on, that just makes it more likely that any break in the habit then com becomes a complete break. Exactly. And this is one of the reasons, like, you know, I did this for a couple of habits for a while, where I did like the Seinfeld method, you know, where you have, you check off every day where you mm -hmm. do the thing. And while that can be very motivating, it can also, I think it can also backfire. Because I've had that, yeah. Yeah, because when you get to the point where you you have like 300 days in a row done and then you miss a day and you kind of have to reset and start from one again, you're like, oh, mm. <laughs> I'm so far away from being where I was yesterday mm. that it's actually demotivating. Yeah. No, it, it's very important to realize that, like you said, things change 
and accept that they change and they cycle too. Mm -hmm. So taking like using a journal versus uh, putting a board on the wall versus using Notion on the computer. I cycle through all three because it works for a time period and then I fall off and then and then I don't. In the past, I used to go months without picking it up again. Now I'm like, that's not working. Back to the board. This yeah. is working for two, three weeks. That's not working. Back to the journal. Yeah. So, and I could only do that again by not being so critical of myself and going, perfectly normal that this fell off. Yeah. Let's go back to something else that worked once upon a time. Yeah. So I think it's it's also related to, and we have a, I can't remember the episode number, but we'll put it in the show notes. Um, we have an episode about self-acceptance and ambition, right? Mm-hmm. Where a lot of, this is the resistance that people usually have against the idea of, like, what if I if I completely accept myself, I'll just lose all of my ambition, mm-hmm. you know? I won't try hard anymore because I already accept myself. So, this is like the fear. And I think this is another example of that where you go, hold on, if I'm if I'm not like hard on myself, right? When when I when I miss a habit, if I don't like punish myself, well then doesn't that mean it's just okay to miss and then I'll miss even more? But like the reality is the opposite, basically. Mm-hmm. It is that when you're doing all this self-judgment and you're catastrophizing and so on because you fell off of a good habit, you're not making it better. You're not making yourself more likely to succeed no. in the future. You are just wasting lots and lots of mental energy, mm-hmm. making yourself feel bad. And if anything, you're lowering your chances mm-hmm. of of building strong habits. And if you just allow yourself to say, oh, okay, this happened. And it's almost like you immediately let go, right? You say, okay, I I, I missed a day. And yes, that's I'm not happy about it, right? I'm disappointed or sad about it or whatever. But And you just let it go. You just let it go and you start again. Mm-hmm. That's it. Yeah. So that's uh, conversations, good habits. Mm-hmm. Let's look at bad habits, yes. like letting go of things. Mm-hmm. So the, the best example I have is that for whatever reason, a story for another day, I quit drinking alcohol. It's eight months now. And everything was going fine. Lockdown, new environment kind of was was fairly easy. It's summertime now, there's a bit of social going on. I've been to a few social gatherings and... Oh, so it's getting hard again. Mm. I've noticed that. So mm. uh, like at seven months in, I was like, oh, I thought the worst was behind me. Here we go again. This is this is getting challenging. Again, I didn't, I just looked at it, did a writing exercise. I, I, I observed how I was feeling and I accepted that this, this was difficult. Mm. I said it to people. I even went to somebody and said, I'm struggling with this again. Mm-hmm. I didn't keep it to myself. And I just I, I just completely and utterly internalized that I am struggling. I accept that I am struggling. And that that allowed me to react again a different way. As we described earlier, it allowed me to go back to the situation. So I went to a, a, like a party, uh, struggled a bit, went home and went, huh, I'm going to do something differently this time. Mm. And fundamentally, it allowed me to tap into the temporal discounting, which basically means that I could look at what was the the short-term discomfort that I was trying to bridge at this party versus what is the long-term gain if I keep this going. Yeah. And every time I come back to that, I just think about it. It takes two, three minutes. It completely resets me. I forget about the whole problem that I'm dealing with and I move on with my life. Mm. So yes, it's taking a little bit of effort. It really is taking a little bit of effort on my part to sort of step in and say, hey, you want this, you're going to have that. Don't worry about the immediate discomfort. Accept it, move on. Meaning that in the course of a month, let's say this last month, I've dealt with this sort of alcohol problem three or four times for three or four minutes mm. at a time, it's sure as hell better than my previous life, if I'm going to call it that, where yeah. I was dealing with this daily, like, oh, this is a problem. Oh, I shouldn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Every situation was just a drag and a mental, like, fight. Yeah. So that little bit of effort, it's like nothing in my life. And, and everything is just, like, easier and mm. So, I mean, I I can't say anything more about how Mm. awesome it is to just have observed and accepted that I'm struggling. Yeah, this is, I think this is, uh, I think this is one of those things that's especially difficult for men. 
Yes. You know, for a man to, yes. to admit, that's one of the things we're, I think we're all taught, right? It's like you never show weakness. You can't, you don't talk about your problems, right? Yeah. This kind of thing. And it's something that, yeah, I think this is, this is true for, especially with a, addictions and whether that's you know whether that's alcohol or or you know gambling or porn or anything else anything. that people are addicted to right there's this feeling of you feel you feel like gross about yourself um and you really wish you you didn't have this problem and then that lends itself to like shoving it away right it's like the last thing you want to do is admit it to someone else mm. and there's real power in that where this is also one of the things where i think writing can be super helpful if you if you just write down, I am struggling with this, right? You just you just process this, like you say, you, you take the reality of what's going on, and that's essentially observing it. It's just mm -hmm. saying, okay, today, or even like right now, I feel like I, I want to reach for my thing, right? For the thing that I'm addicted to that mm -hmm. I know is bad for me in the long term. And I'm struggling with this, and I'm this is difficult, and I wish I didn't have this problem and so on. You just you just express Mm -hmm. what's actually going on, what's truly going on instead of trying to pretend like it's not going on mm -hmm. because that's pointless. <laughs> yeah, right? You didn't choose this. This is also one of those things, right? It's like, <laughs> it's too late. It's too late to pretend like this isn't happening. It's already happening, right? You, and you didn't choose to struggle with this. You didn't choose to have this problem. You didn't choose to have these thoughts arise. This is just where you are right now. Mm -hmm. And even just expressing that, even just expressing it in writing, like admitting that this is going on, often it feels like a weight off your chest. Once you've done it, it's like, oh, actually, it's not that bad. Mm -hmm. And like you said, you can then just go on with your life. Yeah, you can you can react the way you want to react or you should, yeah. or, or a better way to react. Yeah. As Instead you said of being again. taken over by it. Exactly. Yeah. Observe mm -hmm. then react. So one more. Mm. Uh, this is about the negative emotion of self-pity, mm. which I think that's something that was now looking back at any sort of negative episode in my life, Self-pity is one of the phases in there. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's it's kind of later. And in even though I've solved a lot of things when I deal with a negative situation or a stressful situation, uh, I'm not getting angry. I'm not reacting. But the self-pity still creeps in. And I've got a, an example of just two weeks ago, I had a major abscess with a tooth problem. And I kind of took the week slower, accepted that that was okay. But towards the end of the week, when I started feeling better, and technically I could have worked normally and exercised normally, and I did, but I was fighting myself. I was mm -hmm. like, I felt self-pity. I'm like, oh, but you shouldn't have to do this. You, you know, you can take a day off. If... If I wanted a day off, take the day off. Yeah. Just like, yeah. guys, <laughs> instead I'm, of grumbling I, about I, it, I, yeah. I feel better, but I need to take the day off. I yeah. could have said that, and you yeah. guys would have been like, it's fine. You, you yeah. had a crap week. Yeah. But instead, I was like, I'm going to force myself to exercise now. And you know, but you're a fitty theory for myself. It was so <laughs> ridiculous. Yeah. But I was standing there in the park with you guys, and just like, uh, instead of saying anything, I just folded my arms and I was like, what a toddler. <laughs> like you're being <laughs> such a toddler. Yeah. And I think it took 10 minutes to completely and utterly change my perspective. And you guys wouldn't even have noticed it. No, I didn't but notice that. Was I, arrived, <laughs> I arrived with a fake smile. Mm -hmm. Not 10 minutes later, it was a real smile. <laughs> and that was huge for me because it was like all of that was self-pity for a little bit of time. And I was like, completely and that could have gone the other way i could have stayed fake the whole way through the mm -hmm. exercise would have made me feel better for the moment but later in the day would have come up again and it would have come up again and it's the same pattern some deeper part of me was uncomfortable and i needed to change it so yeah the mm -hmm. observation of that allowed me to sort of self-correct it very very instantly yeah. I wonder if I wonder if this is this might be universal as well but I wonder if this is just something we have to unlearn because I do think that many of us have this experience and certainly I had this experience as a child, you know, there's well basically right when you're a baby then what happens is you express your discomfort by crying and then you get comfort and support and so on. 
And that carries on for quite a long time where even as a young child, you can be like in this situation. Well, if I, if I make myself seem more like a victim, I will get more comfort, right? Yeah. I'll get more care and attention. And, and so you learn that you learned like the benefits of being a victim. Yeah. <laughs> and because I, I noticed this in, in myself sometimes too, where I, it's like, yeah, there's like wallowing in self-pity, you mm -hmm. know, wallowing in self-pity where you're going, hold on, why am I doing this? It's actually, it's almost like part of you is expecting that your mother is going to come mm -hmm. rush in and, and give exactly. you comfort, right? Exactly but it's like, no, that. no, this is not the case anymore. Yeah. This is not how it works anymore, right? And to, to unlearn that, and I also remember like, I had this especially, so I've struggled with depression in, in my life. And I had a, a really bad period of depression a few years ago where, yeah, that's also one of the things, obviously, is like you're suffering the entire time and you, you feel sorry for yourself, right? Mm -hmm. You feel sorry for like, why am I doomed to suffer like this, basically? And, and I remember at some point, this thought coming into my head was just like, I'm not a victim. I am not a victim. And it was, it, it's almost, it was one of those things that, uh, that gave me like a moment of relief, right? It's almost like your, your head pops out over the, over the dark clouds of depression, just realizing like, hold on, this is, no, no, no. Even if, even if I feel like shit, even if things are not going well for me, I'm not a victim here. And I can like, I can choose to not be a victim because like being in the victim role is essentially just being like, oh, poor me and like waiting to be rescued, mm -hmm. right? And, and so it's the same thing. It's not, it's not saying things are not bad or I'm not suffering. It's just saying, yes, I am suffering. Things are bad, but I choose not to be a victim. Mm. And yeah, I think that's, that's one of the things we just kind of have to learn or we have to unlearn a mm. habit from, from long ago. Yeah. And we have to learn that you can essentially, um, yeah, accept your suffering without without falling into that victim role. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's and this is where all those different teachings really start to make it clear that that there's some core thing in the inside and then there's the shell thing on the outside and it's mm -hmm. like if you can this one is going to do the bad reaction and this one's going to do the good reaction and you just like zoom out from yourself. I mean literally yeah. it's like there's this like second person that zooms out from you and you're mm -hmm. like watch yourself and yeah. and watching myself <laughs> this was the best part. I laughed at myself, mm. like from from the outside. I was like, "Look at you! You look stupid," but not in a in a self critical way. Like yeah, in a it's just like it's, it's it was silly. funny. It was yeah, silly. Yeah. It was silly yeah. is the better way. Yeah. But um, the one thing, like practically, what do you do? So the simple day to day thing I would say is if you can just learn to observe. That's the simple, you don't have to do anything other than just try and make a note. Like take a breath and go, that was a moment. Mm -hmm. Done. Move on. If you want to, if you're struggling with this, I would say get to the writing. You know, mm -hmm. do the writing exercises. Gratitude for when we mentioned gratitude. Just be grateful for starting your good habits again. Mm -hmm. Self-acceptance for not being so hard on yourself. Um, it's like the same problem looking at it from two mm -hmm. different sides. Mm -hmm. So those two were really big. But there's, there's one that we haven't mentioned yet, which has kind of been very important for me. And we've been dealing a lot with environmental change, sort of designing your environment, but observing, again, your environment. Hmm. It's been a key factor for me because your environment, the way you treat your environment is often a reflection of how you feel. And quite often, well, with me for sure, the environment goes to shit first before hmm. you feel it. And I've really, really noticed this. If my bedroom or, or if basically if I'm stressed out and I'm not doing so well, my bedroom's a mess. My mm. work desktop is a disaster. My kitchen pantry is full of food I shouldn't be eating. But only once I've been doing that, once my bedroom's been horrible my ki and I've been eating bad food for like two weeks, that's when you start sinking into your self-pity and you start mm. like, oh, my life is fucked. Mm. If you can just, again, observe yourself, observe the action, you can catch it before you feel it. Well, and this happened literally that week. I looked at it and I was like, I'm eating chocolate all the time. Mm. I don't feel bad, but 
<laughs> You're about to. <laughs> I'm about to. Something's not right here. Some, I haven't dealt with something or something's yeah. stressing me out. And so, yeah, th that would be the, the last practical point is if you can really observe your environment when it starts going a way that you don't like because yo, it's it's really is an early warning sign. Mm. This just made me think, I've never done this myself, but it, this is something that I think is a worthwhile exercise. Try this out. This could be a writing exercise. It's like evaluate your living space and your workspace as if it was the space of a stranger and basically like tell me who this person is and what's going on for mm -hmm. them just based on the environment, right? Yeah. And and yeah, I think that if you can really step away from it and just like objectively look, what's going on here? What am I seeing? Mm. Um, then yeah, I think it, it could reveal a lot about what's going on in your life and in your inner life that you're not aware of yet. Mm. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, it, it's... It, it, Everything is so closely connected there. I know for a fact that when I exercise in the morning, I make my bed. They go they go together. Mm. When I don't exercise in the morning, I don't make my bed. Mm. So yeah. that's that's what I'm saying. Realizing that you didn't exercise, that can slip by. You just get into life. Mm. But I can come back into the room at 3 o'clock that afternoon and go, huh, I didn't make my bed today. That's a visual cue yeah. that reminds me I didn't exercise. And if I can say, that's okay. Mm -hmm. It's okay. Don't be hard on yourself. We start again. Mm -hmm. Do 10 push-ups right now. And that's, I've literally been doing that. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. I exercise today. And <laughs> I guess what? The moment I finish those 10 push-ups, I'm going to make my <laughs> you bed. Your bed yeah. <laughs> so yeah that, yeah, that for me was kind of the closing bracket on, on a massive improvement on my life that I just really wanted to do. Yeah, yeah, share. Yeah, yeah that's, that's great. I think this is, um, I think this is great because it's like the... <laughs> It's a practical approach to something that is usually very philosophical. Mm -hmm. um, and like we said, it's, it's, uh, it's the kind of thing that usually sounds great and is much easier to say than to do. And yeah, I think we've unpacked some tools here that people can actually use. And and also just again to, as a reminder, right, I think it's really good to just treat this as a skill, as a habit, and just be like, this is not, so it's not an end state that you arrive at, right? The goal is not enlightenment. Mm -mm. And now I'm the perfect observer <laughs> yeah. of everything what happens. No. It's like, no, it's not going to happen. It's it's a habit and you gradually get better at it. Yeah. And you, yeah, like you allow yourself. And this is this is the way it is with all habits essentially, right? There's, it's not going to be an immediate firework of um, of benefits no. and, and life-changing, you know, revelations or whatever. It is you allow this to just slowly improve your life. Yeah. And that's it. It also really helps. This is another thing where journaling really helps because if you start developing such habits, a lot of the positive changes will like creep up on you. And it's really good to then go back, you know, r read about just your writing about how you felt what was going on mm. like six months ago and realize like, wow. This this was a different person, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm a yeah. different person from the person who wrote this. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I th I think this is amazing. Like this is, and and I agree. Obviously, that's um, you know, I place I place a lot of value on on this kind of thing, on developing this ability to observe yourself, on on like reducing that inner critic, right? You're reducing the volume on your inner critic, being more self accepting, and so on. Because this is also just so important for my own life and my own development. I, I've often said that I probably like discovering self-acceptance was like, was maybe the most important step for me in my, for me too. in my journey, because I, I don't know if I can, if I could have done, you know, kind of everything I did in the last 10 years or so, if I was still stuck in the mindset I had, um, when I was younger, which was very, very self-critical, no yeah. self-acceptance and so on. I, I don't know if I could have ever gotten to doing the things that that are like the more obvious things that, you know, where it's like, oh, you build a business successfully or something like that, where it seems like, well, what matters here is, you know, your entrepreneurial skill and whatnot. Well, and of course that matters, mm. but I don't, I feel like I couldn't have gotten to the starting line of doing that exactly. without the self-acceptance work yeah. first. Basically, stop avoiding mistakes and stop observing mm. and learning from. Like, I mean, that's a cliche. You hear that time and time again. But at some point, it clicks into place when when you, you know, it, it's 
same with the the voice in your head. You don't you don't have to turn the volume down on day one. All mm. you have to do is listen to it. Yeah, yeah. That's it. Listen to it, and then when you get sick of it, you like start turning it off mm -hmm. because you you don't need it. And and you know the the flow state thing. It, what happens in flow state is that inner critic just just disappears. Yeah, gone. Mm -hmm. And that's you can you can cultivate that in your life. I I, I now know it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's been great. Nice. All right, that, that's really good. So let's see. Um, so one of the things you can do is you can leave a comment either on YouTube or uh, in the show notes, there's a comment field. And also you can go to anchor.fm forward slash Icario to leave a voice message. I would love for you to let us know if you have you know, experience with the kind of thing we're talking about. If you have other ways in which you've kind of made this practical, like this self-awareness, the self-acceptance, this kind of thing, ways in which to actually make this practical, bring this into your life. If you have anything to share there, I would love to hear it. Um, and also try one or several of the things we've just talked about now and let us know how it went. Um, so yeah, you can do that by by communicating back. You can leave a voice message to anchor FM, anchor.fm forward slash Cario. would love to hear about you. And Obviously, also do all the other things, you know, that podcast hosts say at the end of a podcast, like, you know, go review, leave a review and do the upvoting and whatnot. You get it. All right. <laughs> That's it for cool. today's episode. See you next week. Ciao.